what are hazardous drugs? Um, so there's been a session on that, so we're not going to dive into that. Um, but, you know, the majority of that information, um, you know, kind of what is, is a hazardous drug is, is really provided to us from NIOSH on the NIOSH list. Um, but there also could be additional hazardous drugs that your organization has identified based off your assessment of risk. Um, and then finally, some regulators, including the FDA, um, contend that there are other substances that we need to be um, cautious regarding, particularly beta-lactam antibiotics, um, and make sure that we're cognizant of how, what we're doing um, as we interact with those. So then, you know, one of the questions we get is, well, if our staff aren't compounding, why are we worried about them being exposed, right? You know, they're not the ones manipulating these things, but um, we kind of look at that a little differently. There's a lot of evidence out there um, that these drugs may be contaminated even before they get to us. Um, so you can see there's numerous publications um, that have been published out there about uh, known contamination of hazardous drug vials. Um, and if you see the table um, from a recent publication, um, the percentage of vials in their sampling that were contaminated is actually relatively high. Um, so for a topicide, 98%, doxotaxel, 100%, um, platinum containing 72%. Um, so that's a large percentage of those vials that are coming into our facilities um, contaminated. Um, and you know, if you look at the maximum concentration that was noted, you know, it, it's not negligible. Um, so this is really something that, that, that we need to consider and, and we look at it a little different. Um, so we look at it you know, and look at these vials as well as um, the finished CSPs as thinking of a more of pig pen. You know, so as they move through our organization, we have to recognize that they could be shedding contamination um, and we need to take appropriate steps to contain and mitigate that. Um, so if we think about that as pig pen, let's follow pig pen as he moves through our organization, right? The manufacturer um, is gonna produce these hazardous drugs. They're gonna be distributed to the wholesaler. Um, and then when we place orders, then they're gonna be distributed to us. Um, generally, that's probably gonna be in totes. Um, so, you know, the, the piece there though is that likely those totes don't contain just hazardous drugs. So even the totes that may not contain hazardous drugs could have contained hazardous drugs previously. Um, and so that's something to be aware of that those could also be contaminated. Um, and then once we receive those drugs, um, we then are gonna move those into our negative pressure room for storage prior to being manipulated and then movement to the patient care area. But anywhere that those drugs move kind of during that journey, any of those lily pads, um, those lily pads can now be contaminated via touch or cross-contamination. Um, and so those just become more and more points of contact of contamination that we need to be aware of. Um, you know, finally, we get this, this uh, finished CSP to the patient care area and it's administered. Um, unfortunately, at that point, our job's not done, right? Depending on how that drug um, is gonna be metabolized and excreted, um, potentially um, there can be, you know, hazardous drugs or hazardous byproducts that we need to be aware of. Um, and so then finally, we need to be able to have a system within our facilities um, to not only to capture all of these waste points um, and make sure that not only do we dispose of them pro appropriately, um, but also that we take care of all of the employees and protect them that may be involved in this process. Now that we've kind of talked through that and established that, it, you know, there may be various touch points of hazardous drugs within our organizations, um, what do we do um, to minimize that? Well, USP 800 um, has an entire section on um, deactivating, decontaminating, cleaning, and disinfecting. Um, of course, it starts out by indicating that all areas where hazardous drugs are handled must be deactivated, decontaminated, and cleaned. So this isn't um, a suggestion. This is something we have to do. Um, and then additionally, any sites that engage in that are for sterile compounding must subsequently be disinfected. So let's dive through those, those terms and kind of understand the differences of them. Um, so deactivation, that's the, the end goal, right? Um, so that's literally splitting molecules um, into a way that, that renders the compound inert or inactive. Um, unfortunately, there's not really one proven method to deactivate all drugs. Um, there are some uh, EPA registered products um, that can deactivate certain drugs. Um, but there's not a silver bullet that deactivates all drugs. This is our goal. Um, certainly this is the gold standard, um, but maybe what we're seeing is maybe more degradation. Um, so it's, it is still spoiling molecules in terms of degradation, um, but we may not necessarily know whether the byproducts that we're seeing are hazardous or if they're um, inert.
Um, and so that's really the difference between degradation and deactivation. Um, but the, either of these processes really depend on the susceptibility of those drug agents to that molecule, that EPA registered molecule. Um, also depends on the amount, so the concentration um, of the oxidizing agent. Um, and also it depends on having a sufficient contact time. Once we get any amount of degradation or, um, or deactivation, um, we need to follow that along with decontamination. So that's really more physical removal um, of any of that residue. So any, any of those kind of split um, or degraded molecules, the decontamination is the removal of that um, from those surfaces. So when we look at the products that companies market to your industry to try to decontaminate surfaces, they try to match these criteria the best they can that are in 800. And so we've already gone through what are those criteria that 800 says? How would you defend that this is the right agent to be using and protocol? But there's other criteria to consider, right? There's compatibility with materials. And 800 even calls this out specifically. You need to use an agent that's compatible with materials that you're treating. It's really nice to have pre-saturated wipers. We love that, right? And, um, and, and so that's uh, another criteria that could be important. We do know wipers need to be low lint, so whether they're pre-saturated or not, that's a requirement. And then offered sterile. So we're at that stage where do I have to use sterile within the hood? Yes, it's pretty much gonna be whether it's the disinfectant or the wipes, they need to be sterile. And then uh, let's you know, be honest, cost to treat. Um, this is just one more thing that, that is part of the overhead of, of compounding drugs. And so we need to look at what does it actually cost to do these, these activities. So we created this table and we made sure with, with NHIA that it was okay to go ahead and put the products that you would be able to recognize by name instead of just giving them generics. And we've created a handout that's not only available on the app, but we put some, some copies on your tables. Um, and so again, it goes through those four criteria that we talked about in 800 and then gets into some of those other parameters that very well could be uh, very well important for, for you and the use of these in the facility. And so there's no perfect products. None of the products have checked all the boxes. But there's some that check more than others and some check ones that may be more important to you or defending this to others uh, than, than some of the other factors. I will mention the asterisk because there are products based on bleach and we know bleach in general is very it's known to be a great antimicrobial agent and it's also known because being such a strong oxidizer and high pH that it can do degrade certain hazardous drugs but we also know it can cause substantial corrosion to stainless steel and other surfaces so the people, the, the, the companies that sell these products that have bleach, they always recommend coming back pretty quickly and neutralizing that bleach on your surfaces to avoid or reduce that risk of corrosion. And then it gets in a little bit of a game of, well, if the bleach you just said could deactivate certain drugs, so the longer you leave it on the surface, maybe the better you could have an effect. But now they say come back and neutralize the neutralizer. So it gets a little complicated there. All right, so how does that translate to the typical instructions for use? Well, 800 says you gotta pay attention to that. It's imperative to adhere to the manufacturer's instructions. And so again, you're gonna apply the chemical to wipers or you're gonna use these presets and then you're gonna decide, okay, based on what the manufacturer said and what I need to achieve and the time I need to achieve it, how many passes? What technique am I gonna use? How, many, how much area am I gonna try to wipe with one wipe? and how long do I leave the chemical on the surface before I come back with IPA? And then again, in the CPEC, you're going to do that, but then you say, well, do I have to do the IPA on the floor or on bins or on IV bags or, or, or what else? And so it kind of depends on what you're wiping. So again, how do we know that something works? And 800 says surface wipe sampling is now possible and should, not a must, but should be done to document that in your facility with you, how you're applying these products, that you're getting the effect that, that, that you want or need. And so this is just an example of some of the sampling kits that are out there. And you see a lot of them provide these templates and everybody likes to show sampling on a nice flat surface. But we'll get into the details that maybe that's not always what you're doing. Now 800 further in another section gets into, again, more details. When should I sample? It says routinely. Where should I sample? 
Well, now it gets into things beyond just the CPEC, which has been primarily our focus, and start talking about, as Michael said, where did pig pen go through the facility and leave behind a little bit of drug on the lily pads? And so it suggests maybe you should sample some of those lily pads. And if we go back to pharmacy purchasing products survey from last year, um, actually, no, it's uh, run to the future. It's December 22. I didn't fix that. So their survey is going to look like this. And uh, <laughs> I promise. And uh, the wipe analysis sites say, again, the number one site people are measuring is in the CPEC. But then look at that blue bar. That's actually in the nurse administration area. And so folks, again, are following those drugs and looking at what impact are we doing, what are we doing in the compounding pharmacy that may also have an improvement in the nursing administration or what kind of cleaning or decontamination should they be doing? So if we now start getting towards the practical considerations of all this, I like to talk about the theory and because I'm not a pharmacist um, and, and so the, the relying on experts like yourself and the, and the guidelines and the science is what I do, but then Michael and his team have to figure out how to actually practically implement these things. And so you talk about what area you're swabbing, that can be very important because the more area you swab, if there's more drug on the surface, the more you may measure. And so you got to consider that area. These templates are made for large flat areas, but what if you want to sample a phone or a doorknob or a keyboard? You got to remember if I'm going to come back and do this in six months, I got to make sure that I've really documented what did I swab that six months ago and do that same thing. So wrapping up my section here, again, we've had a lot of must and should in 800 that we've underlined. We actually had some fun, Michael and I, where we, we, we went through and searched for every must, and there's 205 musts or required within 800. Um, so a lot of them we've talked about here, some other ones about disposable gowns that have also been mentioned earlier this week by our other esteemed speakers. And then there's a lot of shoulds, 48, okay? So again, it's tough to go through all this, but, but, but that's what we're going to have to, when it becomes compendably applicable, um, that's what we're going to have to follow and that's what we're going to have to defend to auditors. So that's the end of my part, but now Michael's again take us back through the practical considerations of all this, of how do you actually try to do this in your facility without spending all your time just doing this and not actually compounding drugs for patients. How do we find that balance of what do we you know, need to do to make sure we're taking care of our patients, um, also taking care of our team members. Um, but if you can look at the number of triggers um, that would necessitate cleaning the hood, I think this really gives you the detail um, that we're really kind of looking into. Everybody's focusing um, on all of these shells, um, which is a large list, and so it's leaving very little time to get to the shoulds. Um, and then it's also, okay, if I do some of these shoulds, like wipe sampling, um, you know, what does that do for me? Um, so we look at wipe sampling, and, and maybe if you're considering that, um, there's a lot of other things to look at. Maybe there's some drugs that you're not going to include in your wipe sampling um, protocol because they're not as stable, um, right? So here's a, some shorter stability drugs. Um, and so potentially, you know, if they're, they're shorter stability, um, it, it's conceivable that there's a lower risk of cross-contamination and occupational exposure of these particular agents because they're not just going to be stable on a surface. Um, so I think it's, you got to look at a, a much bigger picture as we kind of work through this. Um, and then we've got to find balance. You know, we've got to find that balance of, you know, how many of the, the shoulds can we implement um, when we do this and, and really you know, try to find those things. You know, if we're considering sampling, you know, trying to focus more on reducing as much as possible um, rather than wholesale elimination. Um, because as Mark said, the kits are really um, pushing to kind of detect very low levels. Um, and then also, you know, it's, it's, you know, especially for individuals who work at larger organizations, you know, feel free to take advantage of resources you have within your organization. So maybe, you know, don't look at tackling 800 as just a pharmacy specific project, but potentially, you know, for example, medical surveillance. How can somebody outside of pharmacy potentially help you with that? That's not only does that help kind of spread the load of 800, but it also may protect those individuals and move some of that data outside of the pharmacy area 
um, and make people be a little bit more honest about some of those conversations you have in a medical surveillance program. Um, so you may have clinical departments that in your organization that are a great fit for that, nursing, um, or you may have human resources that can help you with that. So um, these are really kind of all practical considerations, but really it's a balancing act. Um, you know, we need to make sure we're taking care of our patients. We need to protect our employees, um, but we also have to balance how do we work through all of these um, items.